and I understand that we're running a bit late, so I can only accept three questions, which I will um, field all together. When you ask your question, please identify yourself as well. Thank you very much for a newcomer to Singapore to give such an insight uh, in, in the shorter and longer history of this geography. Um, I'm uh, from the Center for Contemporary Art um, from NTU. Um, I'm, I'm very curious like what you brought up in terms of like um, the connected histories to the Malay Peninsula, but then also uh, when you brought up the, um, the early trading and the connecting um, of different cultures. and. We, we, of course, there is the Peranakan culture, but then still the communication, at least uh, towards us, it's more like clean cultures, like there's Little India, there's Chinatown, etc. I would be very curious in the longer history of intercultural marriages, um, interreligion, like this kind of like coexistence in terms of dreaming a future, like um, how do we deal with like um, multiple multi-ethnic societies in the future, which causes a big problem in many parts of the world. So that's to me very interesting and a very um, unique specificity of Singapore. The other one would go uh, back this morning to the presentation to, of Willy, of William Lim, uh, in terms of um, climate and sustainability. There's knowledge in material, and you also introduced materiality, ways of living, and the knowledge that we have uh, in terms of um, a climate and a geography and the materials, and in terms of the density that we have in the new constructions at this moment, and the new plans for the um, population. So uh, having these big spans and the knowledges that we have, and maybe it was you showed the towers of a much more dense society also historically. Um, what can we draw out of these historical knowledges for maybe a future society? I mean, that's quite some spans, but as we are dreaming, I think it's very interesting if we can um, draw some um, ideas out of maybe the history and how, how did the societies function maybe in much more earlier times here in Singapore as a kind of a hub that might not be communicated much more prior to the 200 years. All right. I know if I was clear. Before we, before we uh, let the candidates answer this, let's field the next two questions, two more. Uh, there's a hand up here and there's a hand down here. I, I'll try and be as brief and succinct as I can. Um, can I, this question is actually directed to Professor Imran. Um, you mentioned just now the CMIO block interpretation of urban geographic history in Singapore town during the colonial era. Do you think that the reason for this is, uh, in retrospect, that the globaliz globalization is still defined uh, in its relevance to transnational capital? And since MNC Capital is still predominantly OECD, um, the agency and control of this process of reimagining re the history of Singapore is still based on along these patterns. That means its relevance today to transnational capital and Singapore's entire marketing process overseas to transnational capital is still the basis on which we are processing history at the moment, or at least the state is doing it. I have a question for both Imran and Eileen. I think um, both of you presented seems to be um, opposite way of looking at history. So Imran, you are very interested in getting the facts right. So you say there are absences, there are silences, we didn't look at Malay sources, we didn't look at this, we didn't look at that. So we have to rectify this, otherwise we are reproducing myth of ourselves as a global city. Whereas Eileen, you seem to suggest that you know it can be more imaginative. You know, We can, for example, look at the retronaut way of um, temporal disruption and, and be more creative about how we look at history, almost as a more, much more imaginative project. So it seems that your approach uh, 
is not so concerned with truth and, and, and reality or, or historical facts. So what would be, for example, can, let's say if the two of you are going to give each other a suggestion or advice, what, what would be the advice you give to Imran? And for Imran, what would you tell Eileen, say that, you know, are you perpetuating more me by all this kind of imaginative leap of um, um, creative reading of all these um, um, photographs and things like that? All right, we have our three questions. Can I just answer? Yeah. I don't write history articles this way, Jiawei. <laughs> I'm suggesting this is a way that everybody can relate to history. And it doesn't just have to be as historians or through a historical lens. But history is there for all of us. And if we're going to dream, if we can use it as an inspiration or a source for dreaming, we don't have to think, oh, well, I have to understand the history and I have to read loads of books and all kinds of different sources. There are other ways in which history can be a resource for our community and our culture. And that, that's all. Imran. Thanks, Jeremy, for the question. I'll start with Jeremy because it's the most immediate and it, it concerns both of us. Um, actually, I, you know I run the, 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 together with a group of friends, a group called Singapura Stories, and that is concerned only with memory rather than getting facts right, if you like. And actually, I would look at those sources also as myth creation. I mean, I refer to a few instances. So it's not really about facts, per se. It's about different voices. And actually, uh, I want to refer us to Paul Cohen, who looked at three keys of history, you know, event, myth, and experience, or personal memory, if you like. And they are overlapping. They, they give you different registers, if you like, of the same event, not necessarily one privileging over the other. That's what Cohen wants us to believe. Uh, and uh, actually, I also want to point out, uh, for example, Lisa, Hong Lisa, made this very important comment. Actually, it was also with you, Professor Kwa, uh, some time back at, at SHS event, where she said, we can't divorce personal memory from the larger workings of politics, for example. It's not like they're different or one is, you know, uh, non-factual or so on, you know, because, for example, your memory of national service, how did that even get conditioned? What, you, what language did you speak in? In, in, your, in your national service experience, all that has to do with national policy of language. Speak Mandarin. You know, she was making these points, these were her points. So I just wanted to, to, to make that clear. That my presentation wasn't about getting facts right, it's about multivalency, it's about multivocality. And right now we're looking at our past only from the voice of colonial sources, and we don't even read against the green. Anne Stoller. I stole that from Anne Stoller. I mean, her name is Anne Stoller. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> And I'm not a historian. These are just areas I'm interested in. So some of the historians there might wince and like, yeah, maybe he, he maybe we need to talk. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not trained in this discipline of histo history. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean. uh, but uh, maybe going back to the point about the first, the first person. Just a quick one about Pranakans. Uh, you see, this is the thing. For example, when you say Pranakan, I wonder which group you're referring to. That it has come to such a point that right now when you say Pranakan, automatically people think of Chinese Pranakan of a certain milieu. But you know, as I do, that is a much larger, and I'm Pranakan in that sense. Both my parents are Pranakan of various intermarriages. And the thing I want to point out, you, you say, what can we draw a lesson of? There is this civilization, if you, if you want to use that term in that sense, or culture, if you prefer. Uh, and Professor Kwa has spoken about it as persistent culture. I want to add on to what he says about this. You know, he says it's cosmopolitan. But I feel, Professor Kwa, your emphasis is a little bit still on the Chinese Pranakan dimension. Uh, and less on the Javano Malay host culture from which these Pranakan cultures even get their existence. There would be no variety of Pranakan cultures, Arab Pranakan, Bugis Pranakan, Chinese Pranakan, you know, you wouldn't get all of these without the Javano Malay host culture. And the Javano Malay host culture is a very open culture. It was founded on trade milieu, you know. And in this culture, if you, Singapore is not unique. That's the other point I wanted to make. There's this thing about Singapore is so unique, we're so multi ethnic No, just go to Palembang. The Palembang Chinese will tell you, and they are Wong Palembang. They will tell you they're not Chinese. They are Wong Palembang of Chinese ethnicity. They will tell you, if you go to Medan, all the Hokkien Chinese in Medan are very different from us. We are Wong Palembang. And the, the Palembang people also will say, yeah, the Chinese of Medan are very different. But if you go to Medan, same thing. The Chinese of Medan are different from the Chinese, even though they are more uh, Hokkien, because they speak a very interesting patois. The, I don't know whether you've encountered Hokkien, uh, Medan Hokkiens. They speak Hokkien with a funny, funny lilt, and they include, you know. So it's actually a Creole culture already, but they are different kind of Pranakan. 
not the Wong Plembang Peranakan Chinese, a very different one. If you go to Batavia, it's different. If you go to Malacca, it's different. But it's all Peranakan Chinese. I'm, I'm restricting myself not to, just to Peranakan Chinese, for example. But the point is that it is the host, host culture that made it possible. Malay, Malayo Javanese host culture is very open. Yeah? The, uh, lang language was, was it, and you didn't, for example, the, the Chiti Baba, uh, the Chiti uh, Pranakans uh, did not convert. They, 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 they are Shaivist. They worship Shiva in Malay, wearing batik sarong and, you know, yeah, that sort of thing. So it is that, if anything, what do we take from this? It is that older civilization that, this is my last point, and I end here at this point. To, I had this discussion the other day with somebody from NHB. We were talking about how do we look at our heritage, you know. I told him we inherit a very problematic understanding. And that understanding is that we must be Chinese, Malay, Indian, or others, whatever that means. Uh, how did this come about? Now, if I want to draw again from the same two places, Medan and Palembang, how did it become different? The difference is in Palembang, the in-migration was much lower. The, the, the population that was multi-ethnic was stable. So the culture that was a cultured Palembangese, Wong Palembang means people of Palembang, not even Malay. You know, they didn't even refer to themselves as Malay because the Palembang Malays are hybrid with Javanese. That's the interesting thing as well. But that's a long history. But the, th the point is that the inward migration was very minimal. So there were no newcomers who said, how come you're like that? What kind of Chinese are you? You don't even speak Chinese. If you look at the history of trauma, cultural trauma of the Chinese Pranakan in Singapore, that was what they went through. The newly migrated Sinke Chinese looked at them, what kind of Chinese are you? You don't even speak Mandarin. So there is a disdain towards a culturedness. The Javano Malay host culture became devalued. And I'm, the Pranakan here would tell you, there was a whole do decades went through where Pranakan children, Chinese Pranakan children in Singapore, because their IC says they're Chinese, they're not allowed to take Malay in school, you know, our mother tongue policy. That is cultural genocide. So much for a global city. Thank you. I suppose that was it. I suspect the conversation will continue. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>